This AIB original programming is being presented thanks to the generous supporters of viewers like you. Did you know that you could be vulnerable to identity theft and even compromise sensitive personal data just with one click of your mouse or with one stroke of a key on your computer keyboard or swiping the wrong way on your handheld smartphone? Well, hi everybody, I'm Audrey Galex, host of AIB's Life Plus. And in this edition of our program, we are going to be talking about how to keep safe in cyberspace. We'll also have some health tips, Plus, you'll hear some pearls of wisdom. But first, let's talk safety on the internet. Meet Howard Jessamy, former headhunter. His laptop was a lifeline to the world. It really is. His friends count on him for news updates on a variety of timely topics. But then, you know, it was a film that you've been violating. He never thought he'd be a victim of a cyber scam. I needed them to release my computer back to me, so I did whatever the first level thing was just so I could get my computer back. Yeah, it's real. By the time it ended, he was in for about $200. I guess whatever hold they had on it, they just let it go. And you had to pay them $200? Yeah, it was like on a credit card, right. That's amazing that they didn't come after you for more. Well, they were trying to because they kept escalating the service was this, this, and this. And then you have three machines? I said, no, I just, just this one. At first, it seemed legit. It like yeah, it popped up and says, your computer has been infected and you need uh, some type of cleaning and whatnot. Now, his words of wisdom learn the hard way. When you see those things now, just pass over it. And, um, but I, I do a lot of um, news-related type things. I get a lot of Google alerts. Don't leave out your Amazon alert. Oh, yeah, Amazon. Yeah, they know us. <laughs> to find out how to avoid or minimize being scammed online, we caught up with internationally recognized cybersecurity expert, Dr. Dave Chatterjee. He's not only senior editor of the Journal of Organizational Computing and Electronic Commerce, He's associate professor in the Department of Management Information Systems at the University of Georgia. All right, Dr. Dave Chatterjee, thanks so much for speaking with us at Life Plus. You know, it's a huge issue, cybersecurity for seniors. But uh, I'm wondering why it's so important to you. Well, um, you know, I've been teaching um, this topic. Um, I call it information security and risk management in my classes for many years now, um, have been doing research for quite a few years on this topic, uh, work serving as a senior editor of a journal with oversight on this topic. Um, I think it's a very important area because the more connected we get electronically, um, we are creating problems for ourselves because it's giving opportunities for hackers to plant malicious software which could destabilize us from taking over your machines and being asked for a ransom to be able to access your files to compromising, say, the, the electricity grid, uh, contaminating the water supply. In fact, I remember Warren Buffett once saying that cybersecurity is a greater risk to humanity than nuclear attacks. And I agree with him. Likening cybersecurity risks to the risk of nuclear war, that's unsettling to say the least. And I'm thinking, you know, here's one person sitting in their home office or in their kitchen with a laptop in front of them, checking recipes or, you know, social media from their mm -hmm. beloved family mm -hmm. and friends. And one little click and it could disrupt or corrupt their entire system, maybe their, their office, their, their, their finances, or when a, a answering an email from someone who you don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. One of, the, one of the basic tips that I give everybody who cares to ask me, 
is to ask yourself a fundamental question. What type of information or data you are most concerned about that you can't afford to lose? What is most important to you? Then the next question you ask yourself, how are you protecting it? How are you saving it? Let's say if I have all my data on this machine, and if this machine gets taken over, or if this machine gets falls down and it's broken, I can't access this data anymore, will I sweat? That's the question I have to ask myself. And then I have to ask myself, what am I doing about it? What kinds of backups uh, do I have in place? Backups can be of different types. You can have backups online. You can have backups on an external hard drive. And I'm also a huge fan of paper backups. You know, it's funny, we are kind of coming, it's like a huge circle. We were paper, we were manual, we went electronic, digital, and then we are recognizing the need to kind of go back to paper in many ways. So life is, it's a circle of knowledge and awareness. You learn, you innovate, you think you have moved on, then you appreciate what you already had, you kind of come back to it. So it's a constant stage, a state of evolution. So, um, you know, from a defense mechanism standpoint, to keep it simple, you need to secure your data, you need to secure your devices, secure the network, the location where the devices reside, and last but not the least, people. And a quick mention about people, the way you secure people is by making them more aware, by informing them, and this should be to some extent self-driven. So before you click on anything else, let's start at the top. Choose your system preferences for security and privacy. Disable automatic login. And choose your password, as well as choose how often you'd need to use it to log back onto your computer. More on creating a strong password in a moment. Set up a firewall to keep messages from unwanted sources out. You can specify what connections you want to block, what connections you want to allow, so it lets you filter um, messages from different nodes or different networks. And this is a good way of reducing the probability of attacks from unknown sources. So this would capture spam? This would so capture, capture spam, this would, capture, this would block messages, they won't even get to your machine. And while the default setting on computers are created with your security in mind, take a few extra steps yourself. This is where you can decide whether you want these apps to be aware of your location or you don't. And it goes without saying that if you make yourself available or accessible physically, um, you are putting yourself at risks. On the other hand, if you make yourself available, then they, they could push products your way that might be beneficial. Say you're walking on the street and you're, you like pizzas, the, the pizza shop 50 yards away, recognizes you are walking in that direction, might text you a discount coupon. So there are some pros and cons about enabling or disabling location services. If you want to be safe, then you disable it. Beyond setting security and privacy settings in your operating system, add another layer of protection by setting security preferences on your browser, like Google. And that feature that lets you autofill personal information, say when you're ordering a book? Your name, your address, your email address, your phone number. While that's a convenient factor, but I like to keep it turned off because I would only enter the information when I feel the need to do so. And that relates to a certain discipline that we must have when we are surfing on the internet or we are browsing. We want to think twice before we provide information about us, about our credit cards, because it can get shared in ways you would never know. Because that information gets sold. Hackers make money selling that information. So we should not, for example, have a website we might use semi-frequently have our credit card automatically there when we make a purchase? My advice is, if you have the option, do not save your credit card. It's convenient, but you run the risk of the credit card being compromised. Uh, many vendors are notorious for 
automatically renewing your service and charging you a certain amount, which may go, you, you may not be monitoring those small amounts, but it all adds up. So I'm not a fan of saving my credit cards. Like, if you notice here, I haven't saved any credit card. And don't let your browser save your passwords either. It's convenient to allow the browser to save your passwords as you go to different sites and you're using, so let's say you're, you have different passwords. It's hard to remember all passwords. But I like to turn it off because I rather remember my password or I rather forget my password and reset it than have a convenient way of remembering it. So I am a huge proponent of not writing down your passwords anywhere. Not storing your passwords anywhere. Store your password in your head. What's the worst that can happen? You'll forget it. You can reset. That's a much better approach than saving it and keeping it somewhere that somebody could possibly access. And I think these are things that people do routinely is save multiple passwords and it, rely it, on that. It's again a, a trade-off between, con we love convenience. You know, it reminds me when I was uh, working on my dissertation in the 90s, mid-90s, I remember um, walking towards the conference room to present my proposal on internet use. I stopped by the mailbox and somebody had left an article in one of the major journals and there was a screaming headline that the internet was a fad, it'll go away, people will never um, use their credit cards on the internet. This was, this was in the mid-90s. When I shared this in the classroom, my students laugh. And I say, I say you're right, you're, it's, you, know, you should laugh, it's funny, but it does tell you something about us, about us users. We love convenience and we will take any risk just because it is convenient. So these are some you know, cautionary steps whereby you compromise a little bit of convenience for your own good. And those of us who are baby boomers, we didn't grow up with this. You're right. You know, it is a, you know, something new that we've adopted, and I wouldn't even just say adopted, but embraced many of us, most of us who I'm aware of, uh, and, but perhaps the younger generation who know no different you know, um, I don't know what the difference is in the psychology. You know, it's interesting you bring it up because um, I was um, looking at the findings of a recent study and they found the baby boomers are more cautious than the millennials when it comes to cybersecurity preparedness, cybersecurity management. They are very aware. So while I'm happy to share my two cents, I'm quite convinced that they know what they're doing. They are very well prepared. Maybe what I have to share will validate, reinforce what they are already doing. But I was very pleased to see that data. It proved, or at least it provided empirical support for the fact that the baby boomers have had a lot of training in cybersecurity at their workplace and they bring that to, to their home and so they're managing their technologies quite well. Or maybe because we didn't grow up with it, we're a little wary of it still, that even is, subconsciously. You're exactly right. That is my theory. That we do not belong to the generation of what we call the digital natives. People who are the digital natives who kind of grew up with the technology they consider using technology second nature to them. They don't think that to be a threat of any sorts. That's part of their life. That's part, part of their being. But people like us, you and me, we were introduced to the technology. It's still separate from our being. So we still look at it with an element of apprehension. And so that could explain some of those findings. So we do take interest. We are careful. We are mindful. and. Those are good traits to have. It's good to be vigilant. Whether you are entering your credit card information or saving it, whether you are going to an ATM machine and drawing money, it's very important to be vigilant. 
developing that security mindset, nurturing that security mindset, to an, to an extent becoming paranoid about security is not a bad thing. To be cyber savvy seniors, you want to create a strong password with four key elements, upper and lowercase letters, plus symbols and numbers. Even more effective, in my view, is a passphrase. passphrase. I love to talk to AIB network. And you can make it a little more complicated, put an excla exclamation mark somewhere, whatever you want to add to, but it's easy to remember. And be careful with programs, attachments, or emails you open, even those from a trusted loved one. If I get an email from a friend, I wouldn't suspect a thing, and if it looks genuine and it asks me to click on a link for a show, for a ticket for a show, I'd click on it. Here's the thing. You have to recognize that your friend's system could be hacked, and somebody else could be sending those messages to his or her contact list. And so you have received a message, but not really from your friend, but from the device that your friend owns, but now taken over by a program, a malicious software, use the word worm. From a standpoint of discipline and, uh, and, and diligence, if you can't restrain from clicking on a link or clicking on an attachment, maybe calling your friend and said, hey, I received this message, is it from you? That's an extra step. It is inconvenient, but it's, it helps secure your data. And we all make mistakes. I click on a lot of links I shouldn't be clicking on. I'm not trying for once to say that I'm this completely secure, perfect cybersecurity guy. And in a way, it's good that I make those mistakes because when I make mistakes, I have stories to share of what not to do. But hackers are always a few steps ahead of us. They're coming up with ways of getting our information through different sources. So let's say I do click on that and I do discover that it's a worm, malware, uh, virus, etc. Trojan horse. What can I do? Well, pray, hope for good luck. Jokes apart, you hope that you have a good antivirus software in place that's going to save the day for you. The worst that could happen, it's taken over your system, you're getting pop-ups all the time, the system has slowed down, windows are opening without you clicking on them. You can tell when your system is infected. Under those circumstances, I would turn off the machine, unplug it, and take it to a professional, have them check it out. That's when you're talking to yourself and saying, I am so happy that I backed up my data because let's, let's assume if this virus gets my device and the data sitting on it, I'm still good. That's the reason why I emphasize backups. You must back up your data periodically. If you're a little paranoid on a daily basis, and I know people, including myself, we back it up on the cloud, which is convenient, but I think you should also have external backups and keep that drive, the external drive offline. If you can keep a device offline and not connected, that's probably the best form of security. All our devices are connected either hardwired or wirelessly, they're constantly running. They're candidates for being taken over by perpetrators and being treated as zombies and being used for launching attacks on other machines. I like to use an example of you left your machine running through the night, next morning, guess who calls you and wants to have breakfast with you? The FBI shows up at your door and they want to talk to you because your device was the source of a denial of service attack, a DNS attack. That is a possibility. You reduce the possibility by taking precautions like turning off the machine completely. Uh, if it's hardwired, remove the connection. The extent possible, extent feasible. Even I am not that disciplined. But I just want to let you know that 
the moment somebody has access to your device, access to your network, you can be in trouble. You're vulnerable. You are vulnerable. You're absolutely vulnerable. That's why when you set up your internet, when you give your network name, there is a feature there uh, that will require a little more digging in. You can ask your service provider to help you identify the feature where people in your area do not see the name of your wireless network. Out of sight, out of mind. Only you should be able to see the name of your network, nobody else. So it's not a matter of you know going back to the you know the Stone Age or you know just being a little bit more vigilant, not being afraid of it. That's right. That's right. Just being a little more vigilant, having a checklist of things that you should be doing, strong passwords, good backups, keep your software updated. Whenever you get a request to run updates, run those updates. Make sure the security uh, softwares are the latest and the best and make sure that the, the anti-spyware feature of the security software is turned on. Um, so you have to take a little bit of care. It's like owning a car and taking the, taking the car in for service where they check out everything. Think about how much time we spent on our devices, whether it's the iPhone or whether it's the laptop. We also need to spend some time learning about our device, how to secure it, how to save it. And again, I go back to my basics. If you are not a fan of doing all those little, little things, then have good backups and don't keep any sensitive data on the device, whether it's your handheld or whether it's a laptop. Don't keep it. So if somebody gets it, yeah, you lose your device, but at least they can't hurt you from a data standpoint. So you have to, the five things that I talk about when I'm talking about securing the organization or for that matter, securing the individual, I say secure the data, secure the device, secure the network over which data travels, secure the location where the device resides, and last but not the least, secure people. And you're thinking, secure people? What does that mean? You secure people by creating awareness, by enhancing awareness. It's not good enough to say, oh, my security guys will take care of it. Oh, I'm just going to call security and they'll give me some tips and I'll follow it. I wouldn't take that approach. I would Google. There's so much information out there, good information. Find out for yourself what are the different settings on your system, on your browser, that you could tweak to secure your data, to secure your device. Uh, be curious. Uh, through curiosity, you'll learn more, you'll ask great questions, you'll find great answers. Before you know it, your level of, level of awareness is so much more than it ever was, and you are better for it. But you're probably thinking, I'm not the Defense Department. All I might have are my grandmother's recipes, some family photos, nothing to hide, no need to worry, right? That's one. When you say you have nothing to worry about by way of your grand, grand, grandkids' pictures, unfortunately, I have to break this to you and I think you're aware, people are using pictures, overlaying pictures with other stuff and using them to again, engage in behavior that is unconscionable. So you're opening yourself up to those kinds of attacks. So in other words, you're compromising on their privacy. When people say they don't have anything about them on their device, well, are they sure that somebody can steal their name, address, social in some way, and we have a an ID theft situation, how sure are they? But I think it's a good exercise to go down that path and ask yourself, if my, de my device got compromised, what kinds of data will fall in the hands of the wrong people? Do I really care? And if, if at the end of that analysis, you came to the conclusion, doesn't matter, hey, that's great, because you have come to that conclusion after a methodical analysis. But I would think when you do that analysis, you will identify 
data or data sets that you wouldn't want to fall in the wrong hands. You know, my son had a high school graduation. I was putting together a, a slideshow for him. So I got pictures of him and his friends. They sent them over to me. I was putting it together. If the, the pictures fell in the wrong hands, they could be misused. And, you know, uh, they could be used for, uh, you know, People carrying photoshopping. Ca photoshopping, carrying out bot attacks, all kinds of things. Unfortunately, people engage in all kinds of acts that are unfortunate, but it's a reality that we have to deal with. So I think it's always good to second guess yourself and go down that path and do a thorough analysis before being absolutely sure that you're good, there's nothing. If the data gets compromised, you don't care. And so many of us have gone to paperless billing yes, for yes, everything. Yes, yes, and, uh, you yes. And even you know, filing our taxes, Yes, of yes, yes. Like paperless billing is a great example. Is it convenient? I am a huge fan of paperless. I don't, at the same time, I want to be in the know of all my transactions. I want to keep a history of my transactions for a certain period of time. If I don't find it convenient doing that online, if that particular service provider doesn't provide me with those capabilities, I'd like to have a backup, and my backup are my paper copies. So that's where I ask for both. I ask for paper copies, plus um, I ask for electronic access, because I want an historical uh, view of my transactions for at least two years. So you, that you have to kind of make some calls. Certain cases, electronic is fine. Certain cases, you want both, uh, depending on your needs and requirements. Remember Howard Jessamy? He has some advice, too, about avoiding cyber scams. If it looks at all suspicious, back out of it as fast as you can. Well, thanks for joining us for another edition of Life Plus. I'm Audrey Galix. We've come to the end of our program. But before we leave, I'd like to offer one more tip for staying safe in cyberspace, just found this here, it's log out. Remember to log out of apps and websites when you're done using them because leaving them open on your computer screen could make you vulnerable to security and privacy risks. So everybody stay safe in general and in cyberspace. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Go to aibtv.com forward slash donate to support programming like this. All contributions are tax deductible.